Seth, intrinsically, we all search for meaning, whether there is meaning or not. And what I like to try to discern is from people's deep understanding of the world in their expertise, what, if anything, they can discern from that. So as a human being, I would predict that you have a desire to know meaning or to search for meaning beyond yourself in some way. But as a physicist focused on quantum information theory, what does that tell you? Well, as a human being, I would say the search for meaning doesn't usually reveal it. <laughs> <laughs> but in my personal experience that that finding meaning in things is often a serendipitous effect, a byproduct of trying to understand what's going on. So, and as a scientist, understanding what's going on and the mechanisms by which physical systems behave is different from searching for meaning. You're looking for something that's more prosaic, just a, a physical theory that's good enough to describe the thing you're looking at. And it need not really mean anything except it worked, it was good enough. However, as part of this searching for mechanism, I find that bits of meaning creep in whether I want them to or not. So my research focuses on how the universe processes information at its most fundamental levels. I use this to try to build quantum computers with my experimental collaborators. And then I also use it to try to understand aspects of the universe as a whole. Because the universe as a whole is effectively a giant computer. Actually, effectively is the wrong word. I think I should use the word my daughters say, which is literally. <laughs> the universe is literally a giant computer. Of course, I'm using it incorrectly because they use it mean literally to mean figuratively. <laughs> that's, that's a new use of the word literally to mean figuratively. But in the old use of the word literally, the universe is literally a quantum computer. That is, it stores bits of information on every elementary particle. Every time those particles interact or collide, those bits are transformed and processed, they flip. And the bit flipping that is going on in the universe is technically a computation. It's what's called a universal computation, capable of doing anything a digital computer can do. So this scientific and mathematical result that the universe is a giant quantum computer, I think does have, dare I say, profound implications for the meaning of what's going on. Some of them are kind of entertaining things and actually sort of liberating. So for instance, the fact that the universe is a giant computer means that there are features of the universe and things that are going to happen that we'll never be able to predict, even if we use the entire universe to predict it. Because it means that there are things that are going to happen where the only way to find out what's going to happen is just to wait and see. And that's kind of nice, really. Like, I mean, it's a good excuse for why well, I didn't realize that this really bad thing was going to happen. It's not, it's not my fault, mm -hmm. right? The way my, my old um, original Mac book pro used to say when it couldn't execute a command in a vaguely feminine voice it's not my fault i can't execute the command it's not my fault <laughs> so the other question which is related to the search for meaning that this computational nature of the universe reveals is a rather deep one i'd say a question that people have been asking for thousands of years which is why the universe has structure? Why is the universe so complex? Why do we see this diversity of living things, of non-living things, stars and planets, variation wherever we go when we look in the heavens, when we look closer to the earth, when we look under a microscope, we see this incredible detail and complexity. Where the heck did that come from? Um, so actually this computational theory of the universe gives us an answer an answer which the ordinary laws of physics don't give us. So the ordinary laws of physics say, well, we have very simple laws. They can be written down on a t-shirt at MIT. Where I'm a professor, I see the laws of the standard model written on t-shirts quite frequently with the laws of gravitation on the back, right? So we have simple laws. And then our observations of the cosmos indicate also that the universe began 13.8 billion years ago in the Big Bang in an exceptionally simple state. So we have a simple state and simple laws. So where did all this complexity come from? In some basic technical sense, the universe should be simple. It's like, you know, we just take these simple laws, we take the simple state, we evolve it forward by a few billions of years. It should be simple. What the heck happened? It's out of control. Because the universe is computing, we now know what happened. Because 
a computer can be a, a very simple thing. The, the, you, we think of computers as having all these bells and whistles and parts that we pay a lot of money for, you know, like this extra memory space and hard drive and stuff like that. But actually to be a universal computer, you can be a very simple, you know, homogeneous thing made out of bits that are just flipping by some law. You know, you can make very simple models of computation that are universal computers. So to be a computer, you can be very simple. And indeed, you know, our universe is a computer because the laws of physics which are simple support universal computation. And then you can also have a very simple state but a state that contains in it the possibility to do pretty much anything that a computer can do. Like, uh, ironically, so, so um, this comes from a funny mathematical feature. So the mathematical feature is that the set, I can have a set where every member of the set is complex and it takes a lot of information to describe, but the whole set is really easy to describe. So I take, you know, all the numbers from here to a billion. Or let's take all billion bit numbers, like even bigger, all the numbers from here to two to the billion. Okay, that's two to the billion is a big number. There are only two to the 300 elementary particles in the universe. This is a large number of things. And almost every one of this set is like a billion bit random number that takes a billion bits to describe. It's like, you don't want to like have this number sitting around. But the whole set was really easy to describe. I just described it, you know, the set of all billion bit numbers. The set itself could be simple. So we can take a computer that it itself is a simple thing and we can tell the computer okay just go out there and systematically compute everything that can be computed okay now that might sound like it's a complicated thing to do but actually the program to do it is simple you just say okay let's try the first yeah. computer program let's see what it's doing then we'll try the second while we're doing that we'll like try the second one see what it's doing you know evolve it forward a few million steps then we'll try the third etc and then you just keep on doing this and you just systematically build up everything that can be computed now the set of everything that can be computed is actually a simple set and it's easy to describe i just described it and it's also easy to produce you like start out with a universal computer like the universe you give it like a simple program which has in it the capacity for computing everything and your computer just starts computing everything willy-nilly but now let's look at the individual things that it is computing so let's look at a member of the set of the things the universe is computing well just in the same way that the set of all billion bit numbers is a simple set but it contains very very random complicated things that are hard to describe so the set of all things that can be computed by our universe is a very complicated set. So we can have very complicated things that arise when this universe that's doing simple things to a simple initial condition. Moreover, there's something really cool about this set because whatever your definition of complexity, does it require thought, self-consciousness, like, you know, humanity or like cars, I don't know. Like, whatever your definition of life, whatever your definition of complexity, those things are computable. So somewhere in the set of things that we can be computed, those things are going to arise. And they'll arise with a relatively high probability. But the things that, that have arisen are a very small set of the possible things that can be computed, which is almost infinite. Absolutely. So when, if you look at the things that can be computed, the universe is out there computing everything. And here I have to introduce a little bit of quantum mechanics into the mix. So what the universe is doing is, is computing everything in what's called quantum parallel. So, you know, quantum bit can be zero, like electron over here, or one electron over there, but it can also be zero and one at the same time, electron here and there at the same time. So I feed in this quantum bit or qubit as a program to a quantum computer. What happens is that the quantum computer does this and does that at the same time. So if we look at what we actually see, realizing that the universe is effectively a quantum computer, what we're seeing is only the result of one of these programs out of many, 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 many possible programs. So we see huge variation in complexity because we only get one tiny piece of all the things that the universe is computing. Meanwhile, out there in quantum land, the computer, the universal computer that is the universe is computing every possible thing. But what we see is only one piece of this giant computation. So we're seeing what's real and everything else is another kind of reality or the or, or the, uh, those kinds of, of quantum computing are possible realities, but we're seeing the one that's actualized. So it depends what you mean by reality, okay? <laughs> well, 
Uh, who knows what we mean by, by reality. But if by reality you mean what's empirically accessible, so the things that you can get information about that are the case, like the fact that we're sitting here with the surf crashing behind us and the wind blowing and the rainbow in the distance and more rain about to fall, you know, that's our empirical reality. We know this is the case. So that empirical reality, the reality we have, that's just our one piece of this overall quantum system, this overall computation. The remaining pieces are real in some quantum sense, but they're not empirically real. These other pieces are what are often called in quantum mechanics the many worlds, that the universe is constantly splitting up into many worlds of which ours is only one. And the key thing to remember there, that if you think that reality is empirical reality, then our world is the real world, and these other worlds are not empirically real. If you want these worlds to be like Quantum real? Sure, you can call them quantum real. But people would say that our world is empirically real to us, but those other worlds are empirically real to those denizens of those worlds. Sure, but I don't care about them. They never write, they never call. <laughs> because exactly because they cannot write, they cannot call, they cannot get us information. So sure, they might be real to them, but I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here by the beach with you, Robert.